sharing his screen. Um, Scott is at the Kremble Research Institute, and he is going to be talking today about modeling, how modeling reveals human rodent differences in H current kinetics influencing resonance in cortical layer 5 neurons. All right, take it away, Scott. Awesome. Thank you very much. I assume PowerPoint is up and we're good there. Uh, so yeah, so my title is obviously a little bit of a mouthful. Uh, when I gave this talk uh, previously, I sort of subtitled it, uh, Why Rodents Aren't Humans. And so what we're going to learn a bit today is how these interspecies differences manifest themselves at the cellular level in uh, cortical layer 5 neurons. Uh, so what I'll do first is sort of walk you through uh, the H-channel subthreshold resonance, these, what these terms mean, what their interactions are, and then what the larger scale functional implications of this is. And I'm going to try to situate this all within the current state of the art in terms of human neuron models. And then I'll walk you through the results of this study, which are A, this full spiking, uh, biophysically detailed multi-compartment model of a human L5 cortical pyramidal cell, how in the creation of this model we came up with this new quantification of the H current distinctly in humans, and then finally what the functional implications are in terms of this dynamic of subthreshold resonance. So there's been this common story in the literature about the relationship between the H current and this activity called subthreshold resonance. You can see an example of subthreshold resonance in the small figure down here. Basically, that's just a frequency preference displayed by the neuron at uh, sub-threshold voltages. So basically, if I give this neuron a, uh, a frequency modulated sinusoid, does it respond with a higher amplitude to a preferential frequency? And you can see here by this sort of hump that this neuron does, you can see it also in this impedance profile that's calculated. Scott, sorry to interrupt. We only see your PowerPoint like screen, so oh, maybe your presenter no. mode in like a different screen. <laughs> that is not... Yeah, we're just looking at the title. <laughs> well, lovely. <laughs> okay, how about that? Yep, that looks good. Okay, sorry about that. Let's get rid of that thing. Okay, so as I was saying, um, I'm, again, I'm sorry about that. So there's this common story in the literature about this relationship between these H channels, these hyperpolarization activated cation channels, and this idea of subthreshold resonance, which I was just talking about. Uh, now you can hopefully see the figure down here. And the idea has been, in order to get this subthreshold resonance, you need enough of these H channels to be expressed. Now, experimentally, recent literature has shown that these H channels tend to be more strongly expressed in humans as opposed to rodents. So the natural follow-up to that logically would be, okay, it would be more likely for us to see this resonant dynamic in human cells as opposed to rodent cells. Uh, some early experimental work in human L3 seemed to confirm this. Uh, and then this, obvious, this does have larger scale implications for whole brain rhythms. This is something that in the you know, mathematical literature, the more mathematically based neuroscience is still under review, but basically there are there is evidence to show that these subthreshold single neuron behaviors play a role in dictating whole brain rhythm. So this could be one factor at play in why, say, you know, human alpha rhythms and rodent alpha rhythms are different. But there's been a bit of a wrench that was thrown into this story, and that was new evidence from human L5. So human L5 actually shows more of this H current than human L3. But subthreshold resonance was not observed in these neurons. And again, you can see here just an example trace of what a lack of subthreshold resonance shows. Seems like you see the voltage uh, peak early on and then the sort of, you know, attenuation. So this was a very counterintuitive result that goes against this theory that more H channels equals more subthreshold resonance. And we thought that perhaps modeling could help untangle this, this story. Now, this also highlights the need to create distinctly human neuron models. Obviously, most of our very detailed uh, neuron models come from the rodent setting, given the availability of rodent experiments and rodent tissue. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Allen Brain Atlas, which has you know, hundreds and hundreds of these very biophysically detailed rodent models. When you look at the human literature, things are much, much more limited. Now, one obvious reason for that is the fact that we have much more limited access to human tissue as opposed to rodent tissue. 
which makes sense because we're obviously limited to the patients coming in for surgery and the capacity to take that tissue and do experiments on, which isn't as widespread. The other thing you notice is that most existing human neuron models make a lot of assumptions based on the rodent literature and a bunch of necessary assumptions based on the rodent literature. So in particular, if you look at these human neuron models, the models for ion channels that are embedded within them tend to come from the rodent literature. And now if there's a difference between species, between humans and rodents in some dynamic that may be, imp may be driven by a single ion channel, we need to start getting into the, you know, the cellular level differences and we need to expand our perspective there. So in general, we need to create a new model. So that gives us some challenges. First, is it even possible to build such a model given the experimental limitations? Then can we use such a model to look at cellular level ion channel differences between the human and the rodent setting? And then can we potentially exploit the benefits of the in silico setting to perform some experiments that might not be feasible in vivo or in vitro to help us understand functional implications of these differences. So lo and behold, we were able to create such a model, otherwise I probably wouldn't be talking to you about it right now. I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty here because of the, I only have 12 minutes, but two things worth highlighting. First, we were able to get both the morphology and the electrophysiological data from the same human layer five cortical neuron. If you attended the Eve Martyr's talk yesterday, you probably recognize how, why that's so important. Given these questions of cell-to-cell -cell variability, wanting to avoid creating Frankenstein models, et cetera. So the fact that we were able to do that was something that we were very proud of and we think makes this model uh, pretty unique. We also focused on properties that we knew were driven by the H current when we were creating these models. And these are twofold. First, these hype the voltage response in response to hyperpolarizing current clamp experiments, and also the capacity for post-inhibitory rebound spiking. Both of these are driven primarily by activity of the H current, and we're able to very successfully replicate these features in our model. Now, the secret sauce in those nice fits that I just showed you was the fact that we had this eureka moment where we abandoned the rodent H channel models as commonly used, and tried to fit the H channel and the H current straight from scratch. And when we did that, it yielded a pretty significant difference between this new human H channel model and the H channel model from the rodent literature. Uh, the citation is Cole et al. in 2006. You see this much right, more rightward shifted steady state activation curve, and you see these much larger values of tau, the membrane time constant. You can think of larger values of tau is meaning the channel is activating and inactivating more slowly. And what was really nice about this is that we had a separate set of experimental data, voltage clamp data, again from that same primary neuron. And you can see that from these triangles here. We were able to extract corresponding approximations of these kinetics of the H current. And we very, very well fit this with our modeling endeavor. So this is a nice validation of our new novel H current model that we were able to get this from primarily matching current clamp data and it still does a really good job re-encapsulating a separate set of voltage clamp data. Now obviously since I'm focused on the H current and I'm focused on resonance, we would like for our neuron to replicate this lack of subthreshold resonance that we saw experimentally in human L5. And lo and behold it did. You can compare the model on the left here in A uh, to what, an example experiment in B. And again, this was a non-trivial surprising result that these neurons lack subthreshold resonance. So this is another nice piece of model validation. And again, we did not directly constrain our model to do this. This came out naturally from our overall modeling process. So again, compare that to these two neuron models I show on the right. Uh, this model from Kalmbach et al. is of human deep layer three. This model of Hay et al. is from rodent layer five. Both of these do exhibit clear subthreshold resonance, you know, by this hump and by these peaks. So we asked ourselves, what's the main difference between these models that might be leading to this? Well, obviously, it's the H current. And in particular, it's that tau value. The fact that the tau value in the human H current model is larger by almost an order of magnitude, by a factor of 10, than the maximum that's seen in the coal model. 
Now, if that was our hypothesis that a larger tau, slower H current, prevents subthreshold resonance, how might we test that? Well, using the in silico setting and this human neuron model, we said, okay, if we notice that we hyperpolarize the voltage, the tau values start to get lower and approach what we see in the rodent setting. So if this hypothesis holds, if we hyperpolarize the neuron and apply the same experimental protocol, we should start to re-establish subthreshold resonance. And again, lo and behold, we got that, otherwise I wouldn't be telling you about it. So you can see here at these low voltages where the tau values of our human neuron are at or even below what's seen in the rodent model, we re-establish this resonance. And it's worth mentioning here that the reverse is actually also true. If we take a model that already exhibited subthreshold resonance and alter it so that we, slow, or that, that we slow down the H current, we end up preventing resonance from occurring. So the causal directionality here is dual, which is really nice support for this hypothesis. So the take home message to conclusion here is that the H current kinetics are as if not more important than the amount of H current in determining subthreshold resonance. Now that's a very specific finding about you know, one specific current and one specific dynamic. Why is this interesting more generally? Well, we've shown that we can create a biophysically detailed, multi-compartment, accurate model of a human neuron, given some of these experimental limitations that you have to face in the human setting. And we've shown that we can gain some really nice understanding of what's going on, even with this limited neuron model. So again, in our modeling process, this allowed us to uncover these changes in the age current and it allowed us to prevent, propose a hypothesis for the actual mechanism of action underlying these interspecies differences. So we think that this modeling strategy, generally speaking, shows how you can get at the cellular level differences that explain, that potentially show why the human and the rodent brain are different, specifically using uh, modeling. Uh, and with that, I'll take your questions. Uh, really quickly, I have to do some shameless self-promotion. We're having a uh, Canadian Computational Neuroscience Spotlight, which has been uh, very much motivated and inspired by the success of Neuromatch that's going to be taking place on June 15th and 16th. Uh, if you're interested in some more cool computational neuroscience from uh, up north, we'd love for you, for, uh, for you to join us. Great. All right. Uh, are there any questions? for Scott. This is well, really, really cool work, by the way. It's really fascinating stuff. Thank you. Um, I don't think I got anything specific. So um, I'll ask one question at least. So how, and I know this is, this is a really open-ended question or hard to answer in a short time frame, but like what were some of the, the key things that you might want to share about how you came about doing the modeling? Like how did you come up with this, this model? Yeah. Like, so, of course, yeah. That's a <laughs> Yeah, that's of course what I had to cut from the talk with it being a 12 minute as opposed to <laughs> longer. Uh, so, but again, basically the, the sort of eureka moment was when we just sort of realized, okay, we have no direct evidence telling us that the human H channel is the same as rodent H channel. So why are we restricting our modeling by doing this? And, you know, if I, I could show you almost, you know, before and after pictures of how inaccurate the model was with this rodent H current, once we allow, we added those degrees of freedom, obviously, you know, the fits took a lot longer, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> but, you know, it yielded something unique, and it actually, sh I think it showed something more powerful, and what's really cool is there is some experimental evidence showing that this actually may be uh, replicated in the differential uh, subunits of the H channel that are differentially expressed in rodent and human, so this is something that's sort of talked around a bit in a bunch of papers, uh, but we think that We've, using modeling, we've been able to sort of highlight something that we sort of known and been talking around but haven't quite fully articulated until mm -hmm. now. Cool. Um, we did get one more question, and, and I will we'll add this one as well. So um, what determines the resonance frequency? Is it the amount, or is it the kinetics of the H channels? Uh, so our hypothesis basically says that it's the kinetics of the H channels. So in all of these in silico manipulations, we're not, at, we're not altering the expression or the, you know, the conductance of the H channel at all. We're basically just shifting where on its uh, you know, tau curve it lies. So our, under, our hypothesis is that it's primarily the kinetics that dictate that 
uh, you could sort of see that by that gradual shifting of the peak frequency uh, in those, you know, DC shift manipulations. So, so that's our hypothesis. And again, this, the, the story is likely much more complicated than that. Subthreshold resonance is a very complicated dynamic. And by no means is it one-to-one, -one, something about the H current means something from subthreshold resonance. The passive properties, the morphology of the neuron, all of these things are coming into play as well. And that's part of why it was really important when we created our model that we did so primarily constrained by, a, by data from a single neuron model so we didn't have these confounds of experimental variability, et cetera, et cetera. I think you might be muted. Yep, sorry. Um, yeah, so again, really cool work. Thanks a lot, Scott. Um, you. And uh, we will now close you out, and we will bring our final speaker of the session